Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me in another episode of Hashtag Real Talk with Aaron Bragg. Today's topic is going to be network security and more specifically, physical network security and why it's still important, even though it's 2020 and everything crazy going on. Uh, my guest today is Steve Barnes. I'm going to be quiet for a minute, Steve, and let you introduce yourself. Oh, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, I'm uh, over on the west side of Michigan, Steve Barnes, working for Fortinet, and I call on our enterprise customers and primarily the automotive manufacturers and uh, furniture manufacturing as well out here on the west side. Thanks for having me on today. Excellent. Well, and both of those uh, are kind of important right now because automotive industry is spinning up. And unfortunately, we saw a local furniture company uh, have an issue with ransomware. So we can talk about that later. So today's topic, like I said, is um, network application security. I'm sorry, net physical network security. I got too many right, things right. going into my head and why it still matters. Because you and I, uh, we were talking before the podcast recording about you know, everybody's talking about the move to the cloud and this and cloud that, and they're almost forgetting to your point, like there are still industries out there that can't go 100% cloud, so to speak. So why is, you know, physical uh, network security still important? Why, you know, access points and firewalls and everything else? Oh, yeah. So we're going to start off. So my podcast is geared towards small and medium businesses. So we're going to start off with the basic stuff. We're going to dig in a little bit more. Um, and figure out like some actual action items that uh, business can take to help. So it's 2020. We're we're getting at the end of 2020. Why uh, why does physical network security still matter in your opinion? Well, uh, certainly you need a certain level of physical security going into your cloud, right? You've got to have some type of access, like wireless APs and wired uh, Ethernet switches. And then having that uh, with zero security connecting into the cloud leaves a lot of questions. Internet of Things is a factor in our own home offices, just like it is in manufacturing or uh, even stadiums or, or any of the businesses you could point to. And we've got, uh, oh, maybe there might in, in the future be some get together at your home. And you've got maybe 10 Apple watches coming in, smart watches, you've got all the phones, but not just that, you've got your own phone and maybe some cameras providing physical security around your home, uh, different devices. I don't know if you still have a printer. I've been driving to the library nowadays. Oh, I still but, have a uh, printer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But uh, all these devices are an Internet of Things challenge. Then you add on your smart TVs and fire sticks and game consoles. And uh, honestly, I got a new washer from uh, the good folks at Whirlpool and, and that joker wanted to get online as well. <laughs> So, you know, every, everything is an Internet of Things challenge. And so you need a certain footprint of in the, in the home and home office physical security to address that as well. You want to be able to do a certain amount of content inspection going outbound, uh, protecting from SSL outbound types of uh, activities, right? You can't oh, see we have a first. Hold on. We have our first acronym. So for the listeners, uh, SSL, what is SSL? SSL is an antiquated protocol that was replaced with TLS, Transport Layer Security. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially SSL or TLS are analogous in conversation describing that secure protocol for your web browser. So if you're going on your banking site and you see the little lock in the screen, you would say, oh, it's SSL or better it'd be TLS as the protocol name would change. But that provides encryption so that while the fully qualified domain name is visible, the FQDN is going to the bank, you're not able to see any of that URL path structure, any of the content, passwords, or whatever else. So it's encrypted. The reason it's important to have some visibility to that in the home is that certainly the hackers and ransomware and malware folks are using SSL outbound to get around security, right? So when the question is, why do we need a certain amount of physical security for, for in the building at the remote edge? Uh, you, you're gonna need a little bit of horsepower to provide that SSL decryption and protection. Excellent. So for those of us that are network, network noobs, right? We got a lot of engineers that know way more than me, even a couple architects. 
Uh, so what's the difference between next gen and stateful, right? Like next gen, I kind of beat up a lot of vendors because everything is, is next gen. But for those listening in, what truly is the difference between um, a stateful firewall and what is a next gen firewall? Well, it's important to acknowledge that most of the firewalls on the market today are next-gen firewalls. All the vendors are doing it. It's, it's table stakes. If you use the gambling analogy, you've got to have next-gen to play. Um, maybe there's some staple functionality and some low-end, low-cost uh, endpoint items out there. But the key difference there, in the evolution, you started out with some access control lists that would say this source and destination IP this port or protocol could, could go here, or could go there. And then Stateful came in and uh, was, was brought into the market in early 2000s, maybe uh, late, late 99. So it's kind of old news, but Stateful would enforce that protocol. So it would say you're doing port 80 and it is HTTP and it knows what to expect there and, and it would enforce that. And FTP is a, a stronger example, a more complex protocol, but it would follow the protocol state and the three-way handshake from beginning to end of that connection and make sure it was all by the book. Now, a next-gen firewall has been out for quite a while as well. Um, next-gen firewall has to be content and application aware. So these are firewalls which can look at the content. Maybe there's a document passing across that has some URLs in it or some malware in it, that kind of stuff. And application aware can decide which applications in use over port 80. Maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's gaming on Facebook, maybe it's uh, YouTube or maybe it's Google search or Gmail. All those Non-critical data, right? Sure, okay. you can discern what's critical and non-critical, secure and insecure. And then you can also say, well, this isn't even doing the right protocol here. It seems weird. And then you can get to that protection level. Where you're saying we don't do anything weird here. We only do these protocols and you allow what you expect and want to allow. Now, uh, last weekend, I got to uh, release Jim's keynote, Jim Kaipoff, <clears throat> one of the directors I work with um, at Spectrum. And he talked about the scenario where we you know, we, do, we kind of dodged a bullet. Well, you know, a lot of preparation and then some luck uh, with ransomware. And then part of the reason why we were able to dodge that bullet was around like, um, you know, default and I, um, yeah. stuff like that, doing the IOC. Are you saying like with content and application awareness, is that something I could build on, right? So last week, the FBI, you know, alerted, and CISA alerted all of us in the healthcare system imminent attack. They did provide um, some IOCs or indicators of compromise. I almost broke my own acronym or L. Um, even though some of them are old, it's still relevant data, right? So when that data is out, could then I take those IOCs and then plug them in and actually take action on like a ransomware situation? Absolutely, absolutely. But in order to enjoy the value of a default deny you've got to be enforcing and uh, one one big consideration is that ssl or tls encryption that if you're allowing all ssl and tls outbound that that's kind of a big hole because you can't watch that application and enforce it and it could be going to a fully qualified domain name a website that you're allowing and maybe relaying, it might be a, a, a really new domain on Amazon or, or Azure that's just relaying to some, some other website that you're not going to allow. So it's important to have that uh, edge equipment that's capable of doing some enforcement in the house or in the remote office and do some SSL decryption there. Otherwise your default deny has a gaping hole with SSL. Now you wanna whitelist what sites and what resources that, that you want to go to. And you could do that with like URL filtering that's available from uh, various uh, various labs will give you a threat feed with that information. Now URL filtering, that's a good one. What, what, is, what is URL filtering? Well, that's the type of thing that the URL is a common acronym, but the, the key in there is the fully qualified domain name that if I'm going to something brand new 
in the cloud, I might not want to let my users hit that, but I'll definitely allow them to hit the Grand Haven public schools over here mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. you know, that makes sense. And some of the corporate sites and banking and other well-known things. Well, through a feed out of the cloud, we can provide you a lot of acceptable URLs and then we can categorize other ones such as, I like to use the analogy of resume sites. Maybe you don't want to allow that during uh, work hours uh, off of the, the corporate resources. Or maybe, maybe gambling is another uh, tame example we could point to. But certainly a lot of these IOCs will give lists of, of domains to avoid. Of course, you want to enforce that if there were any robot or botnet software loaded on your endpoint, that it can't do a reach out over SSL to a command and control website where they then take remote control of your endpoint and use it for whatever it is that they're trying to do, right? So you, you get these IOC lists and through a fabric connector, you can automate the ingestion of that data and prevent those outbound connections. And where it's SSL, you could block it certainly off of the domain name, but you can look in there and inspect the protocol and see a little bit deeper into what's going on and have more granular rules for protections, getting to that default deny that Jim was talking about. So you brought up something that we didn't kind of talk about in the podcast prep that I didn't think about, maybe being a little bit naive or maybe it wasn't putting two to two together, but the automation piece. So the automation piece would be key, right? If you're, you know, because you're a smaller business, you only have a team of five in your IT or maybe even 15, getting that more automated obviously helps free up those resources for other things. So that's something I didn't, I really didn't talk about. So earlier, just a few minutes ago, you talked about SASE and I, and I, and I had a web or podcast recently about that secure, yeah. secure access or I always get this wrong. Is it secure access? No service. Wait, secure, secure access, access service edge. Yep, yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, how let's talk about that a little bit. Cause we talked about the, the cloud portions of that and everything else, but we didn't really talk about like the physical aspects. So obviously is it important to have that physical stuff? Like, you know, devices I have over here helping with that. And then, you know, can you explain a little bit about that? And then why SD, what is, what is SD-WAN? Well, SD-WAN plays into it. And I'll stop you on the acronym and say that that software defined wide area networking, right? The wide area is, is kind of considered the last mile or, or the connectivity between the branch and the ISP or, or the uh, headquarters, that kind of thing. So having a software defined wide area network and application recognition, which the next gen firewall has, right? It's application aware. You could steer certain applications over less expensive bandwidth. You could have a, a Forty extender is a product that will connect into the cellular 4G, 5G networks and give you access that way. But maybe there's an associated cost per bit with that. Maybe you wanna have your backups go over your cable modem and you've got DSL sitting right next to it. So you can decide of your different connections, which ones to use. That brings you high availability that if the cable modem were to go down or the DSL, maybe there's a really impressive cable cut. Maybe you're getting a sprinkler system installed and they cut every cable all the way around your house, right? Never mind diverse entrances in that scenario, but you've got that LTE and that wireless as another option. So your data would be able to flow without a hit as well, the secure access needs to have security there. So you want that endpoint to be able to raise an IPsec or an encrypted tunnel on each of those wide area networks or, or ISP services. So you, you have an ISP providing service and you send your tunnel through it to your SASE edge provider. And, and we're, we're offering that as well. So does it make sense to have a firewall in the house? that's connecting to your firewall in the cloud in that SASE model? Absolutely, because mm -hmm. that secure firewall in the house is giving you network access control, automation, it's protecting your internet access. And that's where a lot of the problems are, right? It's not coming over the corporate network. The link that you click in that email is going over the internet. So if you allow split tunneling or 
direct internet access right off the edge. You want it to be secure. So the, the IOC and the, the malware and the botnet lists and all those things can be enforced at the edge. You get SD-WAN built into the product. So that gives you the high availability and the uh, IPsec for security. That's a pretty big compute resource. But then you add SSL decryption on top of that. And you want those categories coming from a cloud provider so you're not decrypting the banking website, which has a valid certificate. Why do you want to see that? It's the weird stuff that you got to see. And it's often uh, well-known sites, be it YouTube or, or uh, uh, S3 buckets or, or blob storage or, you know, all kinds of things can be in the picture here. So it's really hard, never mind trying to maintain a whitelist, but it's really hard to decide what's white. See, that's, that's a good point. Cause when I first heard about, um, you know, layer seven inspection, right. I know Jim, Jim had talked about doing that for, you know, for a while. And I was like, Hey, that's really great. But I, I always wonder about the processing power, right. Cause that would seem like, yeah. you know, a big company like spectrum health. Um, oof, you know, I couldn't even imagine how much traffic that is. So you're saying how you mitigate that is, certain types of traffic is allowed and you're not cracking open every every ssl packet right you're you're figuring out different ones that you want to look into is that what you're saying true and for privacy like i don't want to decrypt and, and re-encrypt and look in and allow or mess with your medical activities right if you're on electronic medical records and i'm a manufacturer i don't want to get into that i just want to make sure you're going where you say you're going and allow you to do that but if you're doing SSL to a brand new domain on Azure, I've got questions about that. Right. So having the URL and website categorization at your fingertips is a real powerful tool as well. Then when you have SSL that you do want to decrypt and look into, you could have enforcements that say there might be a corporate reason to have Facebook and use it during the day, mm -hmm. but the games part is, is not part of it. Or you know, resumes or, or, you know, car parts or, you know, I don't know. Depends no, on your use case. No. So that's kind of neat. I mean, edgy, uh, these podcasts are educational for me too. Um, because one of the thing, one of the recommendations that the, you know, that the government gave last week was around, you know, taking more proactive changes like, you know, blocking, blocking personal email or, you know, social media sites and stuff like that. We, we, I know we were struggling with how do you figure out what's a valid business use case and what's not a valid use case because, you know, your marketing team does need access to Facebook to promote the next, uh, you know, our insurance wing to promote the next round of, you know, insurance plans coming out. But Aaron Bragg doesn't need to be, like you said, you know, going to Facebook. Not that I do this. I, I'm anti-Facebook actually, but you know, and I remember the old days, like, 2009 or whatever and i'm trying to remember what were some farmville or whatever you know those kind of games so i actually didn't know that you could get that specific where you could allow certain types of facebook stuff and then block so other things that that goes back to the difference with stateful firewall and, and and next gen firewall being application aware a stateful firewall could block all of facebook you could put the ip addresses for that destination and stop it but an application aware firewall can read into that application and allow certain users or certain use cases. So it's much more protocol aware. Excellent. Um, earlier we talked a little bit about ransomware. So let's, 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 let's dive into there a little bit more. Cause um, you know, obviously default deny is where everybody wants to get to, but you know, it's, it's not always easy because of that, you know, that encrypted traffic. So if I'm understanding you right, is that that's how the bad guys basically have adapted since the WannaCry days, right? So the SMB, not small, medium businesses, but the actual SMB port, right? They were sending certain types of traffic out through certain ports. It was easy to block that with default deny. So basically you almost don't have a choice but to do the layer seven right is that what i'm understanding it's not like the bad guys aren't once we figured out they were using this port to do this and we shut it down the bad guys aren't stupid they've adapted so if i'm understanding right you're saying 
they're not doing certain ports. They're just trying to disguise that 443 traffic, right? Totally a game of cat and mouse. And they're trying to move as quickly as they can by changing their websites, their FQDNs, using encryption against us and uh, trying to stay one step ahead. The uh, Microsoft protocol SMB is a good example where if you have content awareness and better yet, if you can do intrusion prevention where you can see signatures and behaviors for different things, as well as understand vulnerabilities of your endpoints in the network, you can protect against that stuff. And that's a good use case for having strong security gear in the office, the home, the, the wherever, right? Because everything is, is really in play at this point in time. So with those protocols, having application awareness and intrusion prevention, watching for behaviors and certain signatures in those behaviors, you could stop it, quarantine a host, communicate over APIs with Fabric. API would be the application programming interface. So the computers are talking to Excellent. each other. <laughs> And uh, they're communicating, hey, I've got a nefarious user over here, block them on all other fronts. And we can start using automation and all of these same moves against them. Another important thing for ransomware is to have an endpoint client on the, the machine there that says, no, you're not encrypting the hard drive. That's not a normal behavior. Why would I allow that? You can have in the kernel level, a routine that identifies 10 or more different behaviors and disallows it. And then looking at the application that's running, you can stop the application. You can set safeguards in place that'll protect you in, in the bigger picture. But man, most of that stuff is coming in through emails and phishing is, is a real problem. So if, if people are looking at their home email on the corporate machine, that's a good use case for SSL and TLS decryption so that you can say, oh, this is, Gmail or Office 365 or Hotmail or you know, whatever it is you got, decide what's corporate relevant and protect it with a secure email gateway and maybe don't allow what's not corporate relevant. And then use some techniques to educate your users that they can hover over the link and see, is it what it says it is? And, and you can start doing internal phishing campaigns to educate the users by tricking. Hey, I got a COVID-19 uh, email I have to click on it to take a survey and then you hover over that link and it says don't click this link this is a <laughs> trick even though it appears to have come from your CIO or your right. help office or whatever so the secure email gateway is really important and what you can do with that of course being content aware you can root out any known viruses and malwares but you can watch for patterns and behaviors and you can take all the URLs in the email and rewrite them so that it comes onto a web server in your domain and then proxies off because they'll weaponize those URLs after you scan and allow that email. Mm -hmm. You've got to scan it at the time of the click. And so that click would come into your secure mail gateway and then you could rescan it and say, no, this is a legit or this is nefarious. There's all kinds of tools of the trade, but you got to protect against really everything. I think your key element is that next gen firewall coming into the, the party and be an application and content aware. And you can't see content that you don't decrypt. So if they're pulling a download over SSL, you may wish that you decrypted and re-encrypted it using your corporate certificate so that the user is uh, able to continue forward without any undue warnings. Okay. Because I, I always wondered when I've tried to go to websites and see if the you know certificates expired, I've always wondered when I do that on the corporate device, it shows like a spectrum network or spectrum certificate, as opposed to like with my, you know, breg.com, which is a let, let's encrypt. So I was, I always wondered how they did that now. Now I know. So maybe they're decrypting what's coming from breg.com and then re-encrypting it with the spectrum certificate, which your spectrum machine is linked to mm -hmm. so it knows to trust that and it won't have any issue so before i get into the to the next uh question i have for you i wanted to pause for a minute is this something to where with with as far as fortinet products or you know any next gen firewall so is the apis then have to kind of go both ways right you got to be able to ingest new data to create new firewall rules 
but if I'm understanding you right, you kind of want to do the same thing. Does uh, does Fortinet's have the ability to talk to like a secure email gateway and others? Is it like a two way? Oh, yeah. API? yeah, we we have that. Rather than having you uh, build the APIs, we we call them uh, uh, out of the box procured. That that it's just fabric connectors, and so we can have the secure email gateway in the sandbox. Sandbox is cool. If I get anything that's not on the bad list, but it's questionable, I can send it to the sandbox and run it on a VM that's just paused, so it's ready to go. And that VM will have fake browsing history and different different metadata and things that'll trick the malware writer because the first thing they do is check, is this a VM? If so, don't, don't launch yourself. Wait until you get to a real machine because they're avoiding sandboxes. So that cat and mouse game goes on and we'll accelerate the clock because the malware might say, I got to wait two months before I launch. So we'll speed the clock in the sandbox. So it's this virtual environment that'll give you a much higher degree of accuracy and even find zero day brand new malware type stuff. But it's going to tell the email security gateway, hey, start watching for this thing. And it's going to tell the firewalls as well because they can do it too. Your web application firewall, which protects inbound SSL, TLS, or port 80, HTTP, HTTPS traffic, mm -hmm. hypertext transfer protocol, it's secure. Um, that web traffic is protected and they'll enforce on a web app firewall to disallow SQL injections to try to bypass passwords or cross site request forgery, different tricks in that realm. All these devices can talk over two way APIs and that really improves your security posture through automation then you're also sending information to the cloud. Hey, I think I found a new zero day. Have your analysts check this out. And if so, push it out to the rest of the good world and uh, pull more data from the cloud or from other providers. For a simple case, I was just doing some work in AWS the other day. Mm -hmm. And when I launch things in the cloud, maybe I auto scale and, and scale out. I've got a couple new servers with new IP addresses that API will tell the firewall about those new IP addresses so I can automatically add them to the protected group. I don't have to code that by hand. The more things cooperate, the lower the likelihood is of a human error where I type something in incorrectly, but it's so much faster. So I could pull in that FBI or, or whatever IOC type data you're getting. I can pull any list you want in and block allowed, do all kinds of stuff. So there's still a really strong case for, for quality uh, endpoint hardware in the home office and, and certainly in the home business. Excellent. So that brings me back to, to uh, not back to, <laughs> brings me to my last question. And this is, this has been great, great, great stuff. I really appreciate it, Steve. Um, so if I'm understanding you right, especially with the push to remote uh, work and everything else, do you foresee 2021 the possibility of like VIPs or you know executives or you know important people having smaller versions of these in their home office for protection? Because you know there's a difference between you know my net here. You know, I got I'm gonna do a I'm gonna do a special on secure network home networking. So I have this Netgear router while it has some great stuff. It's not the same as, well, we're going to pretend that this is, that this is the firewall, right? Like, you know, they're two different things. Is, can you see in 2021 where these, you know, they're because they're, there's more of these in the home office. And I don't mean this is a net gear. I mean like a 40, 40 net or that type of product. Comparable. Sure. Right. You know, we, we've already been doing that for quite a while. And there's value in setting up a small cloud footprint to ingest logs and keep it separate from the regular corporate footprint so that those home users have a, a, an additional layer of privacy, but they get all the same feature functionality. So rather than trying to harden every home at a corporate level, you can have a subset of functionality in the FortiGate cloud, for instance, where you're getting all these updates and everything right to the home office. Then even with a SASE provider that's securing at the cloud edge, that's great. You've got a lot of other processing and capability and SD-WAN happening within the facility. 
So you're, you're getting higher uptimes and still using residential grade ISPs. You're getting better security and, and that kind of posture. And then that plugs directly into a SASE cloud like ours or, or any of the competitors. We need something there in the house to do probably an IPsec tunnel into that SASE edge provider. And so, uh, you know, doing it with additional security functionality makes a ton of sense as the executives and certainly yourself, you have a pretty, pretty large scale footprint on social media. You're a pretty well-known guy. You could become uh, maybe more of a target, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. having, having that use case covered with a, a little better equipment is a good choice. And the good news is the, the four to gates and, and some of these boxes, the same code that's running in my largest data centers, same code that I've got in Azure, AWS, Google, uh, Equinix, same code that's going to run on that little firewall that you've got right there. And all the same feature set, all the functionality. We, we have a hardware chipset in there that accelerates the SSL and uh, IPsec, so you, you don't really get penalized. And it becomes uh, a great value for, for the nominal cost. Definitely. Excellent. Sounds like we might have to do a product review in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I always try and end uh, my podcast on a happy note. So obviously, um, this is uh, those of you listening. This is the evening before the big election. Um, let's let's end it on a positive note. We there's so much stuff happening right now. What do you what are you most hopeful for when it comes to like um, you know physical network security? Is there you guys got some special stuff coming in the pipeline or you just think it's more visibility? What are you most hopeful for in 2021? There's a lot of cool stuff in the pipeline. And I think that while the COVID-19 era has been tragic, it's, it's caused a, a lot of shift and a lot of change in the way that we do business. Even you and I are connected remotely right now, but uh, the, the shift to remote access has been great and it's bringing a lot of flexibility to the workforce. I think it's been a forced experiment that's yielded excellent data and, and excellent results. And R&D has tuned into some of those use cases and needs. So I would say that, that things coming in the pipe are going to be lower cost uh, devices to, to satisfy all of those edge requirements to connect into SASE type environments as well as providing on-prem uh, protection from ransomware, as, as well as uh, the horsepower to do all this SSL at a big headquarters building type of setting, because we're gonna be doing both for a long time and mm -hmm. travel's gonna start coming back somewhat. You know, the, the, it ain't all going back to the way it was, but there's gonna be some amounts of everything and we're in a better position to embrace all of that at this point. Excellent. That is a wonderful way to end the podcast. And then for everybody listening in, uh, originally I was going to be with you at Odd Sides Ale. This was going to be my first uh, yeah. back in person session, but unfortunately here in West Michigan, we're seeing a big spike. And uh, awesome. since I work for a major healthcare system, I am being mindful in uh, practicing what I preach. On a side note, Steve, I do uh, want to look forward to touching base in the future. We're hoping to work something out to actually do a product demo, first ever product demo, right? If we're gonna we're gonna put your company to the test. Can it do home home security or home office security? So, yep. thank you very much again, Steve. I appreciate you taking the time to uh, hang out with us and educate my users. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Thank you.